Hello, uh, good, good morning to all of you. Uh, great to have a couple of uh, club executives here who have taken time out of a busy week when they've got European games to uh, come and speak to us. Um, the panel's called, what can we learn from a startup in football? It must be pretty difficult when you're part of a system that's so entrenched, rules going back more than a century, Sorry, established leagues. Just how can you learn from startups? <laughs> uh, hi to everyone. Uh, yeah, I think it's difficult. It's also difficult when right, you're a yeah. club like us, uh, which was created in 1899, uh, whose fan base um, is uh, very respectful of our legacy, of our tradition, of our history. So innovation uh, is not really uh, at the center of you know the mindset surrounding Olympique de Marseille. Uh, our time horizon in football is next week, is next Sunday, and the game we're going to play. And so the ability, uh, the capability that we develop internally to focus on the long haul uh, is, I think, very challenging, but very, very critical. And, and I think we'll spend some time about that, but, but we're really at Sorry, OM. Yeah are trying to um, uh, so uh, work, think, innovate like a startup. Oh, yeah. Sure. Abstract. Uh, like well, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in really fact, it's quite yeah. difficult to Way consider that a club could be run like a startup. Watch, watch a scene. And clubs, uh, clubs like Marseille or Benfica, we have a revenue of, on average, uh, up to 200 million euros, maybe probably to close to 300 million euros. So w when you ask the question, can we uh, learn something from the startup uh, model, it's difficult to answer yes. Now, in fact, it's not totally true because in the last couple of months, we enter in a new era uh, in terms of the, the digital process that Benfica developed uh, for the last two years and that it's already running now. And the basic idea around digital is that the way you approach the business and the challenges is a, is a different way. You should be also much more agile than you are in a, in, a, in a traditional way of doing things. And agile means that in, inside Benfica, in our case, you are mixing teams and people from different departments without a common boss. So we don't have this idea of a boss who is delivering something in the digital space. We don't have the idea that you run a, a, a meeting every month to check what's happening. In fact, in this new, new era of digital, we run a meeting every morning to see what happened the day before and what we are going to, what you're going to do this day or tomorrow. So we change a lot in, in this area because we are mixing people from IT, we are mixing people from the commercial area, we are mixing people from communication and eventually also from the financial department. And those teams are very agile. So it's somehow like different startups inside the club. And, and like a startup, you rely on an audience, on the customers to, uh, to use your product, to engage with the product. But obviously you are amongst the most uh, popular teams in your country, so you have an inherent fan base. How do you use technology to maintain that relationship and to grow beyond your sort of core markets? Well, it's uh, certainly my obsession to see how uh, young teenagers, young kids uh, focus on other sources of entertainment. Uh, and I think that should be the obsession of uh, people within this industry because football uh, is the universal sport. Uh, because football is on top of the food chain, I think football has become complacent and hasn't yet looked at technologies in the eyes. Uh, I have a 12-year-old daughter. Uh, she spends hours playing Fortnite, killing people. Uh, and it's a daughter, uh, but I know many teenagers who do the same. Uh, and I'd like football to focus on this audience who, by the way, uh, no longer uh, watch uh, football games on TV or, or very little. And when they do, they are multitasking. So what are the implications of that? Uh, I think down the road, uh, the rules of the game will have to evolve. 
Uh, by the way, I was told a few days ago that in the last edition of FIFA 2019, when you score a goal outside the 18 meter line, uh, the goal is worth two points. So maybe uh, a change in the rules of the game will come from eSport or other uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, editors of uh, interactive games. Uh, that has to be factored in. We have to think about the future of this sport. It is universal. It can be played everywhere on, on the face of the earth, and that will remain the case. But I fear and I feel that the elite uh, uh, our clubs and the way football is played at the very highest level will have to evolve using more technologies. And uh, what Domingo said about media is a good example. Um, when we joined and we, when we started at OM, the media strategy revolved around a linear channel, you know, broadcasted on a cable and satellite network. And of course, that's a media strategy of the 20th century. So we had to change uh, our thinking about media because a football club is a media uh, uh, for sure. And so we uh, adopted digital and we really uh, uh, made a lot of efforts, uh, spent a lot of energy uh, uh, trying to develop our footprint over social networks where we now have 10 million uh, loyal followers all across uh, our country and, and Europe. Uh, and, and so this is just another example of uh, our disruptive, the landscape has become over the last uh, years. And indeed, obviously, at OM, you're under private ownership, Frank McCourt, and at uh, Benfica, you have a membership you're, you know, your borders are accountable to. How does it change the fact you've got that huge membership that has such a big say in the running of the club? Well, it's really different because, first of all, you have to think that each one of our members is the owner of the club. And uh, we have more than 200,000 members, paying members. So it gives you a, a big responsibility in terms of addressing their concerns, their behaviors, their expectations. It's totally different. From our side, what we have tried to do is, of course, we want to generate additional revenue, not only with the members, but also with the fans. They can be in Portugal, they can be outside Portugal. And in order to address this idea of generating additional revenue, the first thing is that you have to reach these guys. And you don't know where they are. They know where you, who you are, but you don't know them. The second one is that you have to retain these guys. And to retain these guys, it makes that the content that you are showing to your members and to your fans should be extremely relevant. So reach, retain goes with relevant. Once you retain the, 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 the followers in terms of, of your site and your app, it then will give you the ability to generate additional revenue. But it's every day, it's a challenge, it's a battle to generate every day something that will retain uh, your members and your fans. And we are, that's the reason why we have this, this concept of every day we have something new. It can be players, it can be results, it can be football or different sports, but every day you have to give them something totally new. And that's ultimately the challenge for any football club, profit or glory. How do you balance those uh, challenges out? Obviously, because you are both teams that you have very talented players that often are in demand from clubs higher up the pecking order in football. So how, how do you sort of ch focus on that, the, the profit or the glory? Well, let me answer first because uh, Jacques-Henri has a different challenge because he has a, a shareholder and we don't have exactly the same concept. Our mission is very simple, is to win. We don't have a, a different mission, it's just to win. So when you ask between profitability and glory, we go for glory without uh, putting in danger the profitability. In fact, in the last five years, we generate more than 100 million euros in terms of profitability. But the key focus is to deliver on the pitch. And all the investments we are doing go on the same direction. It can be also in technology, but what you want by the end of the day is to generate additional revenue, and with this additional revenue, you can invest in the team. We, although inside the club you have a different company with a listed company, when you ask the stakeholders, all stakeholders, not only the members, but the sponsors, you can ask the press, you can ask 
even the, 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 the bankers who work with Benfica, they are not expecting you to deliver uh, uh, a strong profit to their uh, pockets. They just expect you to deliver good results in the pitch without destroying the, the sustainability of the company. How do you well, I think, you know, as far as we're concerned, we, we uh, Frank McCourt is a uh, family businessman. Uh, he's not an arbitrageur, uh, a, a financier, um, and, and he has this long-term view uh, over OM and what can be achieved. Uh, we know that uh, this has to, this is a long journey. It will take years. Uh, and the first years will be years of massive investment uh, into the team, into the structure of the club, into its organization, uh, into innovation. And it's great to have him on board so that, of course, we do focus on winning uh, uh, on, on the following Sunday but we also focus on artificial intelligence, uh, on data analytics. Um, you know, football is a game where when you play the game, perception, decision-making are key elements of the game. You know, a, a player on the field has roughly three seconds to pass the ball. So it means that uh, cognitive sciences, neurosciences, uh, artificial intelligence, tomorrow, augmented players uh, will have a place uh, in, in modern football. And, and this needs, requires some time. Uh, the amount of energy that we put, Benfica is probably one of the role models in Europe in nurturing, developing young players uh, in our academies is very critical at a time where, uh, you know, transfers, uh, 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 you know, generate so much money that, that, you know, being able to invest and develop young players is definitely at the center of our business models. This needs time. Uh, this will not come like this, and, and we know that at OM, and we're going to take the time to be more competitive uh, 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 winning every Sunday, which was not the same what was not the case last Sunday. I did try uh, and avoid mentioning I know. the weekend result. Uh, it happens, some. you know, win some, lose some. Yeah. Uh, but definitely invest in the future of the franchise. Because that's ultimately one of the big problems for you, isn't it? Spiraling wage bills and uh, transfer fees, which are skyrocketing across the game. Can technology help to sort of rein those in by actually the breadth of talent you can develop? Well, I'd say yes, definitely yes. There's a lot of things that technology is doing in terms of helping clubs, for example, to identify young players at the right time. Uh, in the past, to watch a, a young player, eventually you'd have to go to the, 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 the place where the, this young player was. Today you have so much technology that if I receive a name, I can have my scouting guys watching 10 games from this young player uh, that he played in the last, uh, let's say, 10 weeks. Okay, technology is helping you also in terms of developing the human performance from your own players. And technology will support, by the end of the day, a lot of decision-making process for the players and for the management. So we, we strong, like uh, Jacques-Henri mentioned, we invest a lot in technology. I will tell you, we invest millions of euros in technology every year. It, it went from a very simple situation where it was just around tracking players, or eventually uh, knowing a little bit what was his, uh, his performance in terms of a game. And now you have so much information. And like uh, Jacques-Henri mentioned, I think that what we are all uh, trying to achieve is to develop predictive models that will allow you to have more information about the team and about the player. I mean, you obviously have an additional challenge in France, the fact you've got one club that's so far away ahead of the rest with the, with the wealth of a nation state behind it, with Qatar back to Paris Saint-Germain. What challenge does that present for you? Well, you know, it goes back to what we, we've addressed so far and, 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 you know, acting like a startup, like a lean organization, because we cannot fight with the same means and resources uh, uh, as PSGs, right? So. Uh, I think, you know, trying to be more innovative uh, uh, is key. We all pursue, you know, the Billy Bean challenge uh, for the non-Americans in the room. Billy Bean was a senior executive with a baseball team called the Oakland A's. And in the, in the early years of, of 
2000, uh, he managed five years out of six to be one of the top five baseball clubs in the league with, the, uh, 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 with a very low budget, actually one of the bottom five budgets in terms of salary and, and, and wages. This is a fantasy for every owner and, and senior executive in the, in the uh, 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 sports industry. And I hear Billy Bean is now getting more focused on European football, which is going to be interesting. Uh, uh, but so we, we, we need to play with, with different weapons. Uh, and also our image and what we want to convey as a club. Uh, you know, we are certainly, although we probably viewed as a big club in France, you know, when you compare with PSG with the Davids against the Goliaths, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, uh, and we had a good game against them uh, two weeks ago. So it means that we can, we have, I like Jürgen Klopp uh, uh, saying the other day, uh, he said, you know, we're a good club. We need to be able to beat the best ones once. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. And of course, the Champions League is one of our key objectives. And we're going to do everything we can to, to reach it. It's very hard to get away from one of the big issues of the week, which is the issue that never goes away from football, which is a Super League. A trans-Europe uh, league, whether that's on a weekly basis or m more frequent than the Champions League. I mean, uh, as you sit here sort of talking about your domestic priorities, how much more advantageous would it be for you to be competing in a European field more regularly, sort of every week, in some form of a le Super League like that? Well, Super League is uh, something that apparently, uh, I'd say in the last uh, maybe two to three years, uh, we were told that uh, the, the, the basic idea of the Super League was at least postponed or eventually closed. Okay? I understand the concept and I understand the basic ideas of those who are uh, in favor of a Super League. But I think that this concept of a Super League will most probably challenge the rest of the clubs who are not participating in the Super League. And from the names we saw this week, uh, Marseille may be in and the Portuguese clubs may be out. But it's not only because of uh, Benfica is in or out. It's uh, clubs with a strong history, with a strong legacy, like Ajax that we're going to play tomorrow, would be out of, the, of these matches when we have a so strong story in, in the European field. So I s very Personally, I don't support the, the idea. Uh, I understand that playing more uh, European games, less domestic games, is eventually beneficial for, uh, for, for, for financial matters. But by the end of the day, if you ask our fans who are their main competitors, they will answer Sporting and Porto. They will not answer Real Madrid and Barcelona. And that's where we are today. And what about, about OM? You, you were named as a team as potentially being invited into this Super League. Well, I, I discovered that <laughs> in the press. So, uh, OK. Uh, well, I think the, the issue is, is that football is, the, uh, um, is, is, is a mini ecosystem of our world, right? Of our modern societies, where inequalities grow stronger, where the gap between the haves and the have-nots uh, is, is getting wider and really when I compare OM with you know some of the top 10 clubs in the world today we are part of the have-nots right uh, um, so it's either we manage to secure a more level playing field or I fear and I believe that the Super League will eventually happen so I think there are many reforms to carry out to undertake so that uh, uh, football remains an open sport uh, uh, where you won't know for sure the result of the upcoming game and where, again, uh, uh, there will be a, a level playing field because that is what matters as far as I'm concerned. I mean, is it a fear or optimism, the fact there could be a Super League in 10, no, I think, years? No, you know, I, I would rather avoid Super League. I think there should be uh, uh, an environment uh, where every club who invests, who uh, is more innovative, more creative, uh, 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 can have a chance, can have a shot. But the reality is uh, that, you know, over the last 20 years, almost all the same clubs have advanced to the, the elimination phase of the Champions League. So 
the Super League is kind of the Champions League today. Uh, uh, let's try to change that and, and, and try to, again, establish a more playing, level playing field. I mean, is, is there a danger that some of the elite clubs can look to some fans as quite greedy, maybe, in trying to break away and alienate other fans of other teams like yourselves? And it can be damaging for football. I mean, does football, as, for its strength, need open competitions where everyone feels they have a chance of potentially winning that big prize? I think that's extremely important that um, the, the fans are linked to the clubs that they, they were linked since they were born. Okay, it's extremely important. If, for example, my kids or my uh, grandkids will become uh, a fan of Juventus or Real Madrid instead of being, being a, f a fan of Benfica, I think it will a little bit destroy the concept. They like to see the players, they like to go to the stadium, and with those very global brands, like you mentioned, if they attract young supporters and the, the clubs, the local clubs will lose those supporters, it will be, uh, I don't think that it's going on, on the right direction. That, that's my belief. Mm. I mean, and, and, and as we you know, talk about these European models, there's also been quite a focus on financial fair play rules in the last uh, few days. Are they something that help you as teams, particularly as you're trying to re-establish your dominance at OM? Do you need those rules to be properly enforced to so there is a level playing field? Well, the, the, our experience of financial fair play has so far been positive. Um, you know, we, we, we joined this club, we, we, we acquired this club at a time which was difficult. Uh, 11 of its best players had been sold. So we explained uh, with very concrete facts and figures that we had to heavily invest over the next three years to be competitive again. And frankly, the people I had in front of me uh, understood that. And, and, and really the point of these discussions were to establish uh, a journey uh, uh, whereby we would be transparent in the way we would spend money and invest in our squad and in our club. But of course, at one point, uh, uh, becoming a self-sustainable club is absolutely key and we don't need financial fair play representatives to tell us that break-even uh, is a very important objective of ours. So, you know, I thought, f as far as I'm concerned, that the discussions were fruitful, were productive, were positive, and we had people uh, in front of us uh, which uh, understood uh, uh, um, the, 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 the situation we were in uh, and our objectives going forward. Because in some ways, something like financial fair play is the opposite of the ethos of a startup because you, you are restrained in terms of your ability to seek the, uh, the targets you might want to. Yes, but they, they have uh, 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 an agreement uh, that can be uh, uh, sought uh, to really uh, work together and share our data and say that if we need to incur losses for at least three seasons, well, so be it, as long as the trajectory uh, 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 is really clear that you're going to reach break even it's in season four and, and even more uh, uh, profit in season five. So I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a good process, uh, which as far as we're concerned, again, uh, uh, we followed uh, uh, and, and so far, it's been, a, it's been a, a good experience. I mean, at Benfica, does it annoy you maybe when some clubs might seem to get favorable treatment under the financial fair play conditions? The fact you might well be trying to obviously do all you can to comply, then other teams maybe get, get off the harshest punishments. Well, uh, uh, my answer is that football should rely on competitive balance. And for that, uh, you need to have good teams well managed, uh, delivering the right profitability. If you are fighting a club with unlimited pockets, uh, it, it's, it's almost unfair competition. We don't have that situation in Portugal. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the French situation, but I understand the, the big challenge for clubs like Olympique de Marseille, uh, Olympique de Lyon, etc., because they are fighting against a, a, a club so rich, so, so big, in terms of, uh, of uh, financial possibilities that it's very difficult for them. But, but again, so that's the reason why 
we are strong supporters of financial fair play. Obviously, we have referenced quite a few things about the Super League, about financial fair play. They emerged from hacks or information that was um, obtained under methods we're unsure of in the last week. You at Benfica have experienced um, the downfalls of technology. You've had um, a hacking which has been quite damaging at times. Um, just what has that experience been like, and particularly the fallout which, it, which is ongoing to, be, to have your information taken from you? Well, it's a very difficult situation and very challenging situation because it's all the information from the last 10 years uh, from Benfica, including personal information, was put on the internet. So I think that this is a, a, a big issue. We are tackling it on different uh, scenarios, uh, on, on, on the battlefield of, of uh, justice, but also on technology. And I have to tell you that we invest millions of euros in the last two years in terms of uh, technology. As we just close up, what the good things and the negatives of being involved so closely on a day-to-day -day basis at a football club? <laughs> uh, losing games is definitely not the, the best feeling, uh, for sure. It's a, it's a very high intensity job, obviously, but a job which uh, some of you uh, experience on a daily basis when you run a startup. I've run uh, startups in the past and I know how demanding it is and uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's the way it is. But, but, but of course, when uh, winning uh, is on the agenda, it's a beautiful feeling as well. Yeah, football is about emotions, okay? And you have to put uh, rational on those emotions. So when the emotions are negative for us, it's a bad day, like Jacques Henri mentioned. When people are extremely happy and they celebrate a winning or a title, etc., it's the best day for us. But we are always not spending the same time as they spend because once we win we are immediately thinking about the next phase well it's been a fascinating sort of half hour or so uh, quite a lot of ground covered there in a busy week for you good luck with the games this week and thanks for your time and thank you thanks for thank listening thanks. thanks thank you Rob. so so